stand together. We've come together this morning to declare the greatness of our God. Let's do that as we sing. Amen. Great are you, Lord.
excited this morning to have some of our middle school students singing with the choir. And the song that we're going to be sharing this morning, the message is found in Isaiah 41. It says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The name of the song is Trust Me.
Good morning, church. We're so excited today. We have a middle schooler, Kaylee DeGracia, coming to be baptized this morning. Yeah, we're excited. It's going to be a fun one. And we're, she's come to share a testimony with us today. Um, good morning. My name is Kaylee DeGracia. I was born into a Christian family. My parents are both pastor's kids, and they grew up in church. My, parent, my grandparents ensured that my parents woke up early on Sunday mornings and arrived at church on time. We have a family tree filled with pastors, church planters, theologians, worship leaders, and church workers. My mom even pursued her master's units in theological seminary, while my younger sister sings in children's choir here at Shadow Mountain Community Church. Our commitment to God's word and serving in the church runs deep in our family. When I was in six years old, my grandma Tina taught me about salvation. She made me recite the sinner's prayer on two separate occasions. She felt the second time would completely seal the deal. I obediently prayed with my grandma twice. It wasn't until I encountered the message from Dr. Dar David Jeremiah that I began to understand the void that I feel deep in my heart. Dr. Jeremiah said that when God reached, created us, he created us with a God-shaped vacuum that can only be filled with him alone. D despite excelling academically, thriving in leadership, and having a solid social circle, the void in my heart kept getting bigger. I attempted to fill the emptiness with achievements, hobbies, and friendships. However, I came to understand that while these pursuits have value, they cannot fill the God-shaped vacuum in my heart. Despite a, wait, this February 11th marked a turning point in my life and my commitment to following Christ. It was a day when I acknowledged my need for a savior, the day I made the conscious decision to accept Jesus Christ in my heart. I'm eternally grateful for the gift of salvation and the opportunity to walk in fellowship with my creator. My life may have its ups and downs, but I find comfort and strength in knowing that I'm never alone, for Jesus is with me. Today, I wish to be baptized because I want to honor his command, place God at the center of my life, I embrace my identity as a child of God, and I'm committed to following him faithfully all the days of my life. Kaylee, based on your testimony of faith in Jesus Christ, it's my honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, good morning. <clears throat> Do you know what service you're in? <laughs> We're glad to see you. Whether you're supposed to be here earlier or you're supposed to be here now, we're glad you're here. I won't say any more about the time change. I usually go off on that every year, but it doesn't seem to change anything, so I'm going to quit doing it. <clears throat> hey, I got to tell you, we have 30 people here from Mississippi who came on a tour bus I don't think they're sitting together, but will you all stand up? Stand up, you guys. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> Thank you. I understand they were in our church service 10 years ago, and came back to see if we're still walking in the truth, and we are. <laughs> so good to have you all here. Thank you for coming. And if you're a first-time guest here, whether you're in the tour group or just wandered in this the service we have a special gift for you after the service out on main street there's a a guest a, a guest table and you will give you will receive a complimentary book and i better tell the people over in the restaurant to get ready for this um, a voucher for you and your family to eat in our cafe today as a thank you for visiting shadow mountain you're all invited. I hope you'll come and do that. It's a special way we can say thank you for being in our church. <clears throat> Just a word of thanksgiving to our music people. You probably wonder where uh, Michael is. He's under the weather today. He's kind of sick, but he'll, he'll get better, and he'll be back next week. I tell everybody he has the pre-election virus. <laughs> I'll leave it there. Uh, <clears throat> The, um, the thing I did want to mention to you is what a great weekend we had last week. Um, we had 8,800 people in our services. We gave away 5,500 copies of the Easter book, which I hope you're reading now. A bunch of people got saved. We had a great weekend, and uh, 
thank you all for, for being here and for inviting your friends. You know, whenever we do that, we always, we always gain new people who come and become friends of this church, and sometimes uh, they give their hearts to Christ. I understand we have scheduled baptisms all the way through March and into halfway into April for all of our services. So it's just a wonderful thing to see what God is doing right now. <clears throat> So uh, this Thursday is our big women's event, uh, girl time. So uh, girls, this is your time. And uh, if you haven't already registered, you can do that. Go to our table out on the patio or go to our website. There's still room for you. We hope you will come and make this a very special time. And then as you know, we're just a few uh, weeks away from Easter. And I have to tell you, one of our former uh, chapel pastors went up north to pastor a church he's just he's just killing it up there if i could use that term i mean the church is growing like crazy and he told me they're going to deliver their easter eggs from a helicopter <laughs> so I, don't get any ideas we're not doing that uh, but uh, we are going to have a big easter egg hunt and we have we'll be giving uh, we'll be presenting ten thousand easter eggs in all three of our easter services and uh I think they said that, and then they said, well, how are we going to do that? We need help. So I'm here to ask you to help us, and here's what you need to do. If you would just take this as an Easter errand for your church. Um, bring unopened bags of individually wrapped nut-free candy to the kids' building. All those terms are important. Unopened bags of individually wrapped nut-free candy to the kids' building, and they will use that to fill up all those eggs and make Easter, a very special time for our kids. You can all do that. Just don't forget it. Put it, no, I want to get your phone out. That, not, that's a, not a good idea. But write it down someplace or make a note in your Bible and make sure you do that this week. <clears throat> We're studying the I am statements of Jesus. What Jesus said about himself in the book of John, seven of those statements. And today we're going to talk about what he said in John 11 and verse 25 where we read these words, I am the resurrection and the life. <clears throat> Author and publishing executive Joseph Bailey was once flying from Chicago to the city of Los Angeles. He engaged the woman sitting next to him in a conversation and she's a, a woman about 40 years old, very well-dressed, very, very articulate, very well-spoken. He said to the woman, where are you from? And she said, I'm from Palm Springs. Knowing Palm Springs to be a city of the rich and famous, he asked, what's Palm Springs like? And she responded, being a very perceptive woman, she said, Palm Springs is a beautiful place filled with unhappy people. Taking advantage of the occasion, he pressed the question, and he said to her, are you unhappy? She said, well, yes, I certainly am. He said, why are you unhappy? She said, well, it, it comes in one word, and that word is mortality. She said, until I was 40, I had perfect eyesight, and shortly thereafter, I went to the doctor because I couldn't see as well as I could before. And ever since that time, these corrective glasses have been assigned to me that not only are my eyes wearing out, but I'm wearing out. Someday I'm going to die, and I haven't been happy since I really realized that. Like so many people who live in the fear of death, and it becomes a bondage to them. That's what she was describing. Aristotle once wrote, death is a dreadful thing, for it is the end. We know better than that. The English writer and philosopher Aldous Huxley said, if you're a busy, film-going, newspaper-reading, chocolate-eating modern, death is hell. But I want to tell you what D.L. Moody said about death. He said, some fine morning you will read in the newspapers that D.L. Moody is dead, but don't you believe it, I'll be more alive that morning than I've ever been in my whole life. Today, we're going to find out what Jesus meant when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. 
And if we truly understand what he meant when he said these words, we will never again have to be afraid as that woman from Palm Springs was, or as so many perhaps even here today uh, are afraid of death. Jesus wants us to understand what he is saying when he talks about the resurrection and the life, and he makes this statement in the context of the story of Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead, as recorded in John chapter 11. To understand what he meant when he said these words, we have to journey to the little town of Bethany, just a couple of miles outside of Jerusalem. And there we find out, first of all, that Jesus is a Savior who meets us in our sorrows. Jesus loves us in our sorrows. Listen to these words. Lazarus has died, and Jesus came and found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. As we enter the story, Jesus arrives in, Bethle in Bethany four days after the death of his dear friend, Lazarus. In Jewish tradition, it was believed that the soul of the deceased person lingered near their body for three days before departing uh, from that place. And on the fourth day, when decomposition would already begin, it was understood the soul had left the body, and that's when death was realized. Now, we know better than that now, but John wanted to emphasize that Lazarus was truly dead, not just sick, not just unconscious. And so four days elapse between the time when he dies and when they actually recognize his death. <clears throat> it is likely that Lazarus was laid to rest in a tomb carved into the rock of a small cave with stone benches along the walls and a burial tunnel of about six feet. The entrance would have been sealed by a large wheel-shaped stone that was rolled across the opening. And after approximately one year, it was customary for the bones to be removed from the tomb and placed in a limestone burial box. News of Lazarus <coughs> passing News of his death spread quickly throughout the town of Bethany, and soon his house was filled with grieving loved ones who had come, some of them from Jerusalem, to offer their condolences. The air was thick with sadness as women wailed and men beat their chests in anguish. In the background, mournful melodies played by hired flute players added to the somber atmosphere. Mary and Martha stood at the center of it all, surrounded by the sorrow of the death of their brother. Amidst this atmosphere of grief and mourning, Jesus arrives. After the resurrection and the life, as the resurrection and the life, he comes to us in our most sorrowful moments. The point I want to make, first of all, is this, that Jesus comes to us in our sorrow. The Bible says that you and I are to weep with those who weep. It is interesting to me that Jesus epitomizes that. Isn't it interesting that there's no mention in the Bible of Jesus laughing? I can't find it, and I know he laughed because he hung out with the disciples. You, you couldn't have done that and not have a sense of humor. Uh, but on three occasions, we are told that Jesus shed tears. In Luke 19, 41, we are told as he drew new to the city of Jerusalem, he wept over the city. Here in the story that we are teaching today, we have one of the shortest verses in the Bible, John 11:35, where we simply read these words, Jesus wept. And in Hebrews chapter 5, we read, he who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Three times the scripture tells us that Jesus wept. It's no wonder that Isaiah prophetically wrote that he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Yes. So let me say to you folks, Jesus knows what it's like to be sad. Maybe you came to church today and you're sad. You're going through some stuff that's just very hard for you to get past. Your head is bowed, not lifted up with excitement. 
Let me remind you that when you go through times like that as a Christian, Jesus shows up. He shows up in your life. He draws near to you. When you don't have the courage or the, or the strength to draw near to him, he draws near to you. It might surprise you to know that as a pastor, there have been times in my life when I have been in such deep anguish, I haven't been able to pray. I've tried to pray, and the words just wouldn't come out of my mouth. In those days, when those things happen, and it hasn't been often, I'm reminded of what the Scripture says about the Holy Spirit who helps us pray when we can't say the words we want to say, but the Holy Spirit takes our groanings, and he translates them into prayer, which ends up before the Father. When you're sad, when you're in sorrow, Jesus shows up. He knows what it is like to be sad. He's not afraid of tears. He moves toward grief. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to those who are brokenhearted. Many of us here know that to be so true, that when we've gone through something that has been awfully hard, that's when we felt the presence of Jesus more than any other time in our life. And we have said to other people, how would you ever get through something like this if you didn't know the Lord, if Jesus wasn't your Savior? It's a solemn promise, one that we may not always welcome with open arms. It takes a bitter sting of a broken heart to feel the presence of the Lord. In those moments when we are unable to come to him, when we're overcome by our own weakness and shattered spirits, that's when he comes to us. That's when he shows up. And often it is when we come to understand his love for us in a very special way. As many of you know, I grew up in a Christian home. My mom and dad were in the ministry all my life, first as pastor, then my father was the president of Cedarville and the chancellor of Cedarville, together served that college for over 50 years. When my father was a pastor, my mother uh, taught a women's Bible study on the weekends, and she was a diligent student, finding material to share with her women. She was an advocate of Christian poetry. I've always liked Christian poetry, but I don't use it much in my sermons because I've observed that when I read Christian poetry, you tune me out. <laughs> and that's a very uncomfortable feeling, so I don't do it much. <laughs> but I'm going to take a risk today and share one of my mother's most favorite poems from one of her favorite poets, a woman by the name of Annie Johnson Flint. She wrote many Christian poems. Here's what she wrote. God has not promised skies always blue, flower-strewn pathways all our lives through. God has not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain, but God has promised strength for the day rest for the labor, light for the way, grace for all trials, help from above, unfailing sympathy, undying love. What a wonderful poem that is. God hasn't told us we won't have dark days or sorrowful times. What he has promised is he will never leave us nor forsake us, and in the midst of our sorrows, he comes to us. So if you came here today, and you're going through a sorrowful time, actually your heart is sad, I want to remind you, take advantage of the relationship you have with the undying Savior. Allow him his presence in your life. During Oliver Cromwell's reign as the Lord Protector of England, <clears throat> there was a young soldier who was sentenced to death. He was engaged to be married and the girl who was engaged to him was heartbroken over the sentence and the realization she was going to lose the one that she loved. So she went to see Oliver Cromwell and she pleaded for her loved one that he would be released and set free, but Cromwell wouldn't do it. And she was told that this young man that she was to be married to, this one she loved, would be executed the next day when the curfew bell sounded. When the sexton went that day to rig the bell, he repeatedly pulled the rope and the bell wouldn't make any sound. You see, this girl had climbed up into the belfry and wrapped herself around the clapper in the bell. 
so that it could not strike the outside of the bell. And her body was smashed and bruised as the rope was pulled, but not a sound was made. She wouldn't let go of that clapper until the rope was limp and they stopped pulling on it. And somehow she managed to climb down, bruised and bleeding, and she met those who were awaiting the execution. And when she told everybody what she had done, the word got back to Cromwell and he commuted the sentence. That's what it means to enter in with sympathy to the one you love, to enter into his plight and his problems. And it works in the family, and it works in the relationship between a husband and a wife, and it is what love is all about. It's the opportunity to share our burdens with one another at the deepest level, to enter into the life of one another. And that's what Jesus does. That's what he majors in. He comes to be with us, and he comes to share our burden, and he takes our place as our Savior. Jesus loves us in our sorrow. Number two, he listens to us in our frustration. And the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus is so filled with humanity, it's hard not to want to read it over and again. The Bible says in verse 20 that Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, ran out to meet him, and Mary was sitting in the house. Martha went out in search of Jesus. Her sister remained at home, overwhelmed by grief at her brother's passing. The scene reminds us of that similar one where Mary sat intently at Jesus' feet. Remember that? And Martha was bustling about with household chores. In that moment, Jesus commended Mary's quiet devotion, but now it is Martha who has Jesus' full attention. Listen to what she said. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Now, we read that in the Scripture, and it doesn't take hold of us, but can you imagine walking up to the Savior of the world, to the Lord Jesus Christ, and saying something like that? Jesus, you're late. Where have you been? Can you relate to Martha? <laughs> I mean, have you ever felt this way? Lord, you arrived too late? Where were you when my loved one took their final breath? Where were you when my marriage fell apart? Where were you when my parents abandoned each other when I was overlooked for the promotion that I worked so hard to get? Lord, where have you been? Those are real heartfelt questions, and they are questions that Jesus is not afraid of. After all, he's the resurrection and the life. If he can handle the grave, he can handle whatever your frustration might be. Richard Phillips reminds us of the importance of such praying. He says, Christians sometimes think it is wrong for a believer to speak frankly with the Lord. But God invites us to pour our hearts out to him. He tells us in his book, cast all your anxieties on him. Cast them on him because he cares for you. And that includes our burdens and our griefs, our questions and our frustrations. God's willingness to receive the grieving complaints of our heart is proved by his tender ministry to Martha on the road to Bethany. I've noticed in the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms, that many of the prayers were lamentations. They were complaints. David complained to God a lot in his prayers. There's one prayer where he kept saying, Lord, how long, how long, how long am I going to have to wait? Here's a couple of illustrations of these kind of prayers in the Psalms. Psalm 55, 2, attend to me and hear me. I am restless in my complaint. <laughs> or Psalm 142, 1 and 2, I pour out my complaint before him. I declare before him my trouble. If you read the Psalms of David, you will discover that the beginning of many of his Psalms is like that. He's telling the Lord, what's going on in his life. And he's not being bashful, and he's not trying to make it more spiritual. He's just letting it all out. <clears throat> the Psalms of the men are treasures for us who are saints. I really discovered that during a period of time when I was relentlessly journaling. 
Now, I still journaled, not all the time, but in periods, and I guess I should be journaling now because lots of stuff is happening to me <laughs> these days, but when I go back and read my journals, I'm surprised at how bold I have been to tell God what's wrong in my life and what I need. My journals were kind of interesting, probably not like some of you. It was just a letter to God every day. My journal always began, Dear Lord, and then I would write out my prayer, sometimes four and five pages in a computer. And I would describe to the Lord what was happening and what I needed and why wasn't he doing what I needed him to do. And please hear me. And when you go back and read them, they seem quite irreverent. But they were not irreverent at the time. And I've come to the conclusion that they're not irreverent to God. God wants to hear what's in our heart. You say, well, doesn't he already know? Yes, he does. But he wants you to know. And somehow when you put that in writing or when you put it in words, it clarifies and crystallizes what the real need is. And you hear your own heart telling God what's going on in your life. These prayers give inspired voice to troubled souls. They model for us how to complain to God in a way that honors him. Now notice, Mary hadn't given up on God. She hadn't given up on the Lord Jesus. The rest of her prayer helps us to understand that she still held on to her faith. She believed that Jesus had the power to bring about change, and she actually said, Lord, you were late, but I know that even now, whatever you ask from God, God will give it to you. It was clear that she had not lost her trust. There really is such a thing as faith-filled frustration. I've had it, and so have you. Jesus loves us in our sorrows. He listens to us in our frustration. But most of all, he lifts us out of our despair. Jesus encountered Martha during her time of sorrow, and then he listens to her frustration, but he did not abandon her in that state. He encouraged Martha with some of the most powerful and profound words ever spoken, ever printed in the Bible. He said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Now, when Jesus said these words in his day, there was a big debate about the resurrection uh, among the Jewish people. Uh, they did not all agree on whether there was such a thing. The Pharisees believed in a future resurrection. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Martha was apparently in agreement with the Pharisees, and she told Jesus, yes, she had faith in the future resurrection of Lazarus. But Jesus wasn't talking only about a future resurrection. And with a subtle shift, Jesus redirects Martha's attention from the distant resurrection to the person who is standing right in front of her. He says, Martha, I know that you're thinking about the future resurrection, but listen, girl, I am the resurrection and the life. And if that is true, you don't have to wait until the future resurrection. You have to take note of who you are and where you are and in whose presence you stand. In other words, resurrection and life are not simply abstract ideas, but living and breathing realities in Jesus. J.C. Ryle said that Jesus is not merely a human teacher of the resurrection, but the divine author of all resurrection, whether spiritual or physical, and the root and fountain of all life. Can you imagine what it was like for Martha? Her brother dying, her hope being focused on some future date when she might see him again in the resurrection. And then as the reality begins to dawn on her that the future resurrection was dependent upon the one who was standing in her presence, and therefore there must be more to this than she was catching. In verses 25 and 26, Jesus kind of unpacks this in a unique way. He actually gives us two I am statements 
which we've kind of rolled into one. He says, I am the resurrection and I am the life. When Jesus says he is the resurrection, he says, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. According to the recorded events in the New Testament, Jesus performed the miracle of raising three individuals out of death. And there's a striking contrast to all three of them. Notice, the first person he raised was an only son brought back to life at the gate of Nain in Luke 7, 12. The second was an only daughter resurrected within the walls of Jairus' house, Luke 8, 42. And finally, his third resurrection was an only brother who was called forth from his tomb in Bethany in the story of Lazarus. Isn't that like Jesus? He raised an only son, an only daughter, and an only brother. The compassion of our Lord for those who face the pain and tragedy of death. But here Jesus doesn't say he will perform resurrections. He doesn't promise he's going to do more of what he did three of. No, no, he says, I am the resurrection. Here is Jesus' answer to the fear of death. Jesus says that those who believe in him will live, even if they die physically. This is the great hope that Paul wrote about in his first letter to the Corinthians. He said, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Carla and Peter Tuff have ser served the Lord in Grand, Forks, in Grand Forks, North Dakota for many years. During a family vacation a few years ago, their daughter, Rachel, 29 years old, tragically died as the result of a pulmonary embolism. In their grief, the couple stumbled upon an Easter card that Rachel had made with a picture of her and her siblings as children and a handwritten Bible verse, John 11, 25 and 26. The verse brought them comfort and reminded them that through belief in Christ, death is not the end. In a way, Peter said it felt like she was assuring us through Scripture in her card of the promises of God. That card now rests on the mantle of their house to remind them again and again that there's life after death and the worst thing isn't the last thing. Jesus lifts us above the despair of death by showing us that he is the resurrection and that one day we too will be resurrected. When we put our trust in him, we cancel out spiritual death. When we put our trust in him, we go right past spiritual death and our life continues forever and ever with the Lord Jesus. Then Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. <clears throat> and whoever believes and lives in me will never die. Here Jesus isn't merely talking about physical death. He's referring to spiritual death. Do you realize that if you are born physically, you will eventually experience physical death? All of us know that if Jesus doesn't come back. Human death has a statistic of 100%. Did you know that? But if you are born spiritually, you will never face spiritual death. You say, what is spiritual death? Physical death is the separation of the soul from the body. Spiritual death is the separation of the soul from God. And if you die the second death, you are forever away from God in a place called hell. You don't want to die spiritually. And the way you keep from dying spiritually is by being born spiritually. You have to be born again. You have to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And that's what Jesus means when he says, whosoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whosoever believes in me shall never die. You put your trust in Christ, you can stop worrying about death. Physical death will take you out of this life, but it will just introduce you into the most beautiful life you can imagine. 
and that is eternal life with Jesus Christ, which began at the moment of your, of your salvation. Jesus is the life. When you accept Jesus Christ, you get his life. It's interesting when you study the I am statements that all of them are kind of about life. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the light of life. He's the door into life. He's the shepherd who lays down his life. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and he is the resurrection and the life. Jesus is life. <clears throat> I've been listening, as many of you have, to some of the things that are being said about the times in which we live. And during this last week, I heard a pundit talking about how there just seems to be a disaffection of all of life, that people are just kind of saddened about what life is all about, that the real meaning of life has kind of escaped us and we've let it slip out of the door so that what used to be a, a kind of adventurous life and exciting life has become a humdrum, monotonous day by day trying to figure out how to get next, get through the next hoop to the next place. Life has become a boring, meaningless existence. I think those are the exact words. The Bible says when you accept Jesus Christ and he becomes your Savior, he comes to give you life. Life abundantly, says the Scripture. What does that mean? The new life that Jesus gives us is marked by provision and guidance and an awareness that there's more to what, what is you than what's going on today. I love how one author says this. He says, life is what we are alive to. People come alive to that which excites and delights and satisfies them, that which is at the heart of their very being. And Christians come alive to anything that relates to Christ. Are you alive to Christ, Christians? Are you alive to him? Does he resonate in your bosom? Do you think of him? Uh, when you awake in the morning, is he one of the first thoughts? Do you ever say good night to him before you go to sleep? Do you call upon him in the midst of the trials? You know, you don't have to have a formula prayer. You just have to say, God, I need help. And he's there. The Bible says in Colossians 3 that Christ is our life. Philippians says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. 1 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So when you receive Christ, when you allow him to perform his resurrection right in your spiritual being, you not only get the assurance of life in the future, you get life now. He is the resurrection and he's the life. And I want to tell you something. I've been testing this out for over 50 years. There's no life like the Christian life. There's no life like walking with Christ every day. He doesn't promise, as the poet said, life without pain. He promises life with the personal Savior in the midst of it all. And he walks with us and takes care of us. And he's the, he's the co-pilot who sits next to you in the driver's seat of your life. <coughs> that is what Sharon Dutra discovered. You see, her life was about as rough as it gets. She endured a miserable home life and was in and out of foster care. She was arrested again and again, addicted, married, divorced, living on the streets, looking for food in garbage cans. By age 29, she'd been arrested 13 times. <coughs> in a crowded woman's prison, she read the story of George H. Meyer, who had been the chauffeur and getaway driver for Al Capone. Meyer wrote of finding Jesus Christ in his life, and his testimony pierced her heart. Suddenly she said, I had remorse over my sin. I wept over what I had done to people and for my self-hatred. I asked God for forgiveness. As I prayed, I felt God's grace wash over me. When I got up off the floor, I was a brand new person. 
That was more than 30 years ago, and Sharon is still living in newness of life. When Jesus Christ becomes your Lord and Savior, it's not just for the moment, it's forever. And forever starts the moment you believe. The life you look forward to someday in the future is the life you have now. If you just recognized he's come to give you life more abundantly. In my study this week, I was captured by these words written by a friend of mine, Warren Wiersbe, in his book, Jesus in the Present Tense. Here's what he wrote. He said, the Lord can move into dead and seemingly hopeless human situations. And by his resurrection power, he can transform people and circumstances and infuse life that makes everything new. Over the centuries, this has happened to many local churches and other ministries as well as individual lives, and it can still happen today. There's a lot of places you can go when you're looking for hope and help, but there's only one place where the guarantee is absolute, and that's you come to Jesus. He's never failed anyone who will come to him. He's not going to start with you. His promise is that he will make you new make you different, make you what he intended you to be when he created you. He can raise you from spiritual death, give you spiritual life, and then give you life, real life, life in the future and life today. <clears throat> I'm going to close by reminding you that this life is not just for this generation, but this life can often be generational. Now, you don't inherit eternal life, but what you believe can be passed on to those you love. I've often told you about my initial experiences as a pastor in Fort Wayne, Indiana. One of the families that I had the privilege of winning to Christ, husband and wife, this man was the head of the shoe department at Sears. And I remember going to his home and praying with him and his wife, and they accepted Christ. And then shortly after that, they led their children to Christ. I went back to that church uh, for its 50th anniversary. Now, I know that makes me old. I started the church, and it just had its 50th anniversary. But you know who was at that church? Those people that came to Christ almost 50 years before, and their sons who have gone to a Christian school and are now serving the Lord in ministry. That's what Jesus does. He doesn't change you. He changes you and allows you to be the change agent in your children and your grandchildren and your friends and your loved ones. He wants to start something new in your life, but it's got to start with you. You cannot, you cannot give what you don't possess. So you have to possess Jesus before you can share him with anyone else. Do you know him? Will you accept him? Will you receive him? Will you believe in him? And will you do it today as we close this service? Let's bow together in prayer. <clears throat> Lord God, we believe that you are with us in this service. We sense your presence. And we know that you are specifically dealing with individuals in this building. So my prayer today is that for anyone who's never accepted you as their Savior and Lord, this will be the day when they can grab hold of the promise that he who lives and believes in me will never die. I pray that you will give them the faith to believe that you are who you say you are, that you have come to do what you said you came to do, to seek and to save that which is lost. And Father, give them the, the faith to believe and pray this prayer after me. If you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, in your heart, as I pray this prayer, you pray it in your heart. You pray this prayer to the Lord. Dear Lord, I know I am a sinner, and I know that I cannot save myself, and I need you. Lord Jesus, please forgive my sin and come and take up your existence in my life. Come and live within my heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the son of the living God. 
that you died for me on the cross and came victorious out of the grave on the third day. And today, I place you on the throne of my life in my heart. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed before we finish this prayer. If you prayed that prayer with me today for the first time, would you just lift your hand up until I see it? I'd just like to know that you prayed it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Here in this section and over here in the back. Yes, sir. And over here and up in the balcony all around. Father, thank you for these who have knowingly, willingly invited you into their life. May this be the beginning of a wonderful journey that will cause them to remember this day for as long as they live. I thank you, Lord, that because they have prayed this prayer, I will see them someday in heaven. And I pray that you will encourage them and strengthen them in their walk with you. Bring uh, around them, if they do not already have Christian friends, bring around Christian friends who can help them grow in their faith. Give them courage to take the next steps that lie before them. And I give you the praise. And Lord, I thank you for the comfort and encouragement of this message to all of us who are already Christians. We knew some of this. We know more of it now, and we affirm it all. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are our resurrection and life. And we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together, shall we? We're going to sing just a couple of verses of uh, Amazing Grace. I think I just have about enough voice to do that. And then my voice is gone. <laughs> But uh, let me just tell you this, if, if we, when we sing this song, if during the song or right after we finished, you, you, you should come down here if you prayed with me today and get some information that we'd just like to give you. It's a, a packet of booklets that will help you know what next steps to take to, to walk with the Lord, how, how to really grow in your faith. And we want you to have it. There's no strings attached. We're not going to take you in a back room anywhere or anything. We just want to give you this information. I hope you'll come and get it. If you want to talk to somebody, you can sure let them know. But otherwise, get the information, take it home with you, and study it. If you're Christians and you believe this is where you should place your church membership, we don't make a big deal about it, but it is a big deal. For when you become a member of this church, we put you to work. You get to serve the Lord and begin to use the, the abilities that he's given you. I hope you will come and do that. Maybe you need to be baptized. Let them know that when you come forward. But right now, let's rejoice in our faith. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Verses 1 and 4. Let's sing it together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he strengthen you in your faith. May he use you this week to share what Jesus means to you so that others may find him as well. May the Lord bless you financially and bless your families and bless your workplace and bless your home. May God go with you as our prayer and may you fall in love with him in a new and special way during the days of this coming week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. amen.